Welcome into another episode of the Bourbon and a Buddy podcast brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. Uh, my name is Shane Reardon, executive producer, 670 The Score. I'm very grateful to be joined by new White Sox manager, Pedro Grafol, who I believe is in his home in Miami, yeah? That is correct. When are you going to Arizona? Because you're skipping out on some shitty Chicago weather, I'll tell you that right now. Well, um, I'm actually heading out to Arizona on Monday for about three or four uh, days for meetings and then um, I've been going down there for 10 years and this is the first time I'm not going to be able to get there by February 1st because we have the uh, golf tournament yeah. and the Super Bowl so the um, the rooms are all taken the yep. Airbnbs are all filled up I mean there's no there's nowhere to stay there's there's nothing I think our gambling network, BetQL, here at The Score is sending their entire lineup down to Phoenix for the Super Bowl. And they were looking at Airbnbs, and it was something like 40, 50 grand a night for oh, how yeah. It's oh, yeah. insane. Absolutely yeah. insane. Do you, yeah, I mean, the closest, I think the closest uh, they could get me was like hour, hour, and 10 minutes away. And I'm like, you know what? Let's go to Arizona three or four days uh, right now. Um, get all the meetings uh, done. Let me see the, let us, let the coaches see the landscape of the facility, set it all up. And then uh, we can head out a little later. You know? You've been to Camelback, right? I have. Yeah. It's go It's gorgeous. It's really nice. It's, it's a perfect facility. Perfect yeah. facility. Since you're going to be home for the Super Bowl, do you usually host a Super Bowl party? We do. do go somewhere. Yeah. We do. Yeah. What's your uh, what's your go to hors d'oeuvre or appetizer? Are you in the kitchen making something or? I'm not. Or... I'm not really. Um, Ali is. She loves doing that. I mean, they normally what we've done is everybody brings something, um, and everybody um, when it's all said and done, the kitchen's full of food. Um, but she likes to go get this uh, chicken dip there that that we buy three or four of those, and and um, as a matter of fact, they bought a couple today. I don't, I don't know the name of it, but uh, buffalo chicken dip. Buffalo chicken dip. There so you go. Good. Yeah, and uh, we crushed one one of them today. I didn't. I wasn't expecting to eat it all, but we did. We crushed it. No chips, no bread. Just it, it, I. I I'm midnight, one a.m. I wake up, open the fridge, grab a fork, and just start shoving that stuff down. <laughs> so, I normally do that with peanut butter. Oh, In the middle of, middle of the night, I grab a scoop of peanut butter, eat it, and go to bed. <laughs> Pedro, an ex of mine got me an engraved spoon. Uh, called Shane's peanut butter spoon because I do the same thing. Yeah. So I had a peanut butter spoon in the cabinet ready for me to scoop some peanut butter. Yeah, that's what I do when I get really hungry. Instead of going in there and just crushing anything I see inside, I just grab a spoon, get a get a scoop of peanut butter and get a little orange juice or something, and just go straight to bed. What's been the most enjoyable part of this experience so far? Is your, your first year as the manager, the head coach of a baseball team? Uh, it's a new organization, just meeting new people, um, speaking to the players. Uh, these guys are hungry for hungry to do special things. Um, it, it just, just meeting new people. Uh, it, it's been really, really uh, special been really nice. Uh, the welcoming to Chicago has been really unbelievable. I've been to a Hawks game, a Bulls game, restaurants. Uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's been nice. Um, Chicago's a great city. Uh, I believe we got a good team full of just great kids, um, men uh, that are hungry to do good things, man. What's been the, the best restaurant so far? I, I consider myself a little bit of a food snob here in Chicago, and I, I like the good spots. What have you liked? Um, I went to Chicago Cut the other day with my wife and uh, my daughter, Lauren. Okay. Um, David Flom, I think he's one of the owners. Matt Moore is the other owner. Mm -hmm. um, we had a nice time. I don't think David was David wasn't there that day, but Matt sat with us for a little bit, and um, we had a great meal. Um, two couple of days later, we went to uh, Rosemary's. You went to Rosemary. Went to Rosemary's. Okay, so that's my one of my good friends, Joe Flam, who won Top Chef, who has Rosemary. I'm Joe there Flam. like a week. Did you love yeah. it? Uh, I loved it. Joe wasn't there. Oh, damn. Uh, he wasn't there, but um, we were recommended uh, Rosemary's, and we went and sat there at Party of Five, and we we crushed it. It was unbelievable. Do you remember the order? You know what? We had some octopus. We had um, we had the ribs. We yeah. had um, uh, pasta. Oh, I had the tortellini. Yeah. Um, 
they recommend it like eight dishes or nine yeah. dishes. You know, it's for like people. two or three per person. Is per person, they, right? They, they and go out there low. You leave loaded. It was yeah. awesome. Um, I think that's going to be a a nice little hanging spot for us. We yeah. we loved it. Yeah. So Joe, if you like to cut, you like a good steakhouse. Joe also has Boulevard Steakhouse, which is just a couple blocks down from Rosemary. Oh, really? Awesome. He just took it over. Um, that, that's a really good spot, too. So if you want, Maybe that's where he was that day. Yeah, he must have been at Boulevard. Yeah. Um, is, I, I don't know how to, how, to techn- how to word this, but is this – have you found it to be difficult so far, or, or do you feel like you are in the spot where you're supposed to be? I feel like I'm in the spot where I'm supposed to be. And the reason I say that hum- – I humbly say that uh, is because – I've done a lot of things in this game to prepare myself for this. Um, you know, as a farm director, when you're running a, a department with over 200 people, 50 staff members, you get a nice little wake up call, you know, on leadership. You get a wake up call on being able be having to delegate, not doing everything, on, you know, on your own, uh, not micromanaging. Uh, so that's, that's part of my leadership. And I, I, my first year as a farm director, I struggled with that. Um, you know, I tried to micromanage anything, everything, and I was, I felt like I had a fire hydrant in my mouth. You know, every night it was just, I, I, I couldn't even sleep. So, and then as, you know, year two came on, year three, you know, uh, came in, you, you learn how to kind of delegate, uh, manage and winter ball, scouted, you know, so the evaluation part, the leading part, the uh, leading a department, um, managing older guys, managing young guys, uh, running a spring training, which is critical. You know, our staff, I'm, I'm very uh, happy with the fact that we have three coordinators, uh, ex-coordinators um, with Eddie Rodriguez, myself, Charlie, and even Mike Tozer has done some coordinating. Um, that uh, I'm, I'm happy that we we have experience doing that. So uh, I haven't found it difficult. Uh, I have found it challenging. You know, there's a lot going on, you know, and, uh, you, you know, you got the players, you got the media, you got front office, you got trying to put a roster together. Uh, you got to build relationships. Uh, you got to set up work plans, uh, individual plans, uh, set up spring training. But uh, it's, it's not anything that I haven't done before. So uh, I love that it's challenging, um, but difficult. Uh, I'm not finding it difficult. The last time somebody from this organization was on this podcast, it was Rick Hahn, and we recorded at like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, and it is bourbon and a buddy, and I drank because I'm a, I'm a degenerate, and, and it, it, if there's an excuse to have a glass of whiskey at 10 o'clock in the morning at work, I'm going to take it. It's 6 p.m. local time here, 7 p.m. by you. You opted to pour a glass of whiskey, and I, I appreciate that, and you, uh, you poured some Basil Hayden. Is that okay. your, your usual go-to? That is, um, I got larceny that I like as well. Larceny's good. Um, yeah, I love a good old fashioned. Yeah, uh, that's when I use the larceny. Uh, whistle pig is good. I love yep. whistle pig, but um, this is my favorite right here. It's my go-to. Well, I, I appreciate you indulging. And speaking of the organization, your players that you're just starting to get to know have a reputation for coming on the radio show that I produce here in Chicago, Parkinson Spiegel, and swearing. I don't know what it is. It's it's Liam. It's Lance Lynn. It's Kendall Graveman. It's Joe Kelly. It's what formerly Billy Hamilton. Um, these guys love to come on this radio show and just swear. About five six months ago, Joe Kelly was in studio with us for an hour, and he swore nine times over the span of an hour. And then just <laughs> days ago, he came on again to promote the book and, and, and to talk about. Liam's unfortunate diagnosis that we you know, yeah. we all have the faith, all the faith in the world that he's going to beat. Yeah. And I told him when I, when I called him up, I was like, Hey, last time you were in with us, you swore nine times. I almost lost my job. Let's lock it up a little bit here. And he cut me off. He's like, I know I remember I'm not going to do it. And he swore two times again. So do you have a plan to rein these guys in so I can keep my mediocre job here at 670 to score, or are you just going to let them go? Let these you know guys- what? Uh, I'm going to let them go, except when they're here with you. You know, how about how about that? We want you to keep your job. Yeah. But uh, I also want them to be themselves, whatever, whatever makes them go. Um, but we'll 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 make sure we get everybody together. And when they're here with you, Shane, we'll, um, you know, we'll tell them to, you know, just 
turn it down a notch so you can continue to do what you do. Yeah, I appreciate that. Even if not, I don't like the job that much. So I, I, <laughs> well, yeah. I won't keep doing it. Then. You never know. <laughs> I'm going for a change. Um, we had Ned Yost on uh, the day you were hired I, I, on the afternoon show here at The Score. And he told us a story about a time when you and Sally Perez, who I know you're very fond of because we're very close, didn't talk for like two weeks. Hmm. And it, it was all about holding him accountable or, or something like that. And that's kind of been the theme. Whenever we put somebody on to give us background about you, especially in the hiring process, when it was, is it going to be this guy? Is it going to be that guy? Everyone spoke about how good you are at holding people accountable. Do you remember that time with Sally Perez when you guys didn't talk for a couple of weeks or a couple of days or something like that? That's, that's one just- of many. That's one of many. Um, yeah. That was a part. That's a big part of our relationship. Um, I told him from day one, I, I you know, uh, I'm going to let you be you when I think you is wrong, you know, and I want you to do the same to me. Uh, so as we grew closer together, uh, I consider him like my son, you know, I have three daughters. He's, he's my one son, you know, um, and sometimes you got to have difficult conversations, right? And if he likes to hear it, great. If he doesn't like to hear it, great, you know, uh, but so there's, there's been plenty of times where we've had a few difficult conversations and it's turned into three or four days without, without speaking. And then it becomes who realizes that they were wrong first, you know? Um, a lot of times he'll just pass by after a couple of days and give me a hug and a kiss. And I know that's over. Um, sometimes it might take a little longer, but at the end of the day, we know that it's, it's for each other's best. Um, and all we're doing it, we're doing it for is to grow grow together and then, you know, grow to be who we're supposed to be, you know, which is role models, do the right thing and, you know, and, and perform on the field. You know, if, if this is about playing hard, working hard, you know, and giving the fans what they deserve on a daily basis. And if we're not doing that, shame on us. we got to hold each other accountable. What's the strategy for a guy who maybe doesn't operate like Salvi does and someone that you really need to connect with, but it's just it's not really lining up? You know, accountability for me is not like getting in somebody's face. And that's what I want people to, you know, to understand. Um, I think accountability for me is empowering people, right? And letting people know that we need you. Uh, we need you to do the right thing. We need you to work hard. We need you to take this serious. Um, we, uh, we got high expectations here and, and empowering them, you know, to develop their schedule, to help develop their schedule, to help develop their work, um, you know, what, whatever the case may be. And once you do that and you make them a part of the process, most of the time they'll hold themselves accountable. If not, it's an easy thing. It's an easy conversation. Like, hey, we, we discussed this, you know, um, you told me this, I, I gave you the leeway to do what you needed to do. And it's not, it's not getting done. So let's talk about it. So um, once I think the issues come when you don't empower people and then you try to hold them accountable and they walk in the, in your office and go, what are you holding me accountable for? You didn't let me do anything. I almost saw it right there, by the way. Um, you, you can't, you see, you can clear on this, it, but when we're on the radio, and we're dealing with the FCC, then we can't swear. But you can swear. Okay. You can swear right. you Cause I, Cause I almost let one loose right there. Um, but uh, you know, you walk in my office and you know, and, and you're, you have all the right in the world to tell me the hell are you all holding me accountable for? You didn't, I'm, I wasn't a part of this. Maybe I didn't agree with this or, or uh, you never told me I had to do this, you know? So that's where the, that's where the miscommunication comes. Um, it's, it's hard work to empower people because you have to have a lot of conversations and you got to be a good listener, but that's what, that's what accountability is about. Um, And that's, that's our job as a staff, empowering these players uh, to be a part of the process. And when a player or a coach is not doing what we spoke about, shit, you should hold yourself accountable first. And if you don't, then somebody else is going to hold you accountable. And that's probably going to be me. So, and if it's not you, you need a clubhouse leader, right? And, and sure. the White Sox, unfortunately, I, I know everyone, every, you said it in your, your opening presser, every team in baseball wants Jose Abreu in their locker room. Right. But you know these guys a little bit. 
is there a clear clubhouse leader there, you think? Or is that something that just kind of develops naturally over the course of a season? Here's what I do know. Um, that leadership is 90% taken and 10% given. Okay? I do know that. Um, I've seen it over and over and over again. You'll get a clubhouse full of 26 guys, and all of a sudden you'll see a guy just, just step up and take it right over time. Uh, it could be 10 days. It could be 20. It could be 30. Here's what I do know. We have leaders in that clubhouse. They just haven't had to lead yet because we had a really good leader in Jose Abreu, right? So they haven't had to do it. Now they got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. And um, those conversations are going to be a part of um, spring training. It'll be a part of our culture. Uh, we will have a leader, two, three, four. We will have them because in that clubhouse, I believe that somebody – it's going to step up and lead this club um, as a player. You know, for sure we'll have leaders, you know, as a staff, and, and I'll lead. That's what I'm getting paid to do. Um, but uh, we also need leaders in that clubhouse, and I am certain that somebody, you know, or, or more than one are going to step up and lead. A player in, in, in that White Sox fans, and rightfully so, are, are have been fixated on for the last few years, a guy with – incredible athletic talent who shows flashes of being one of the best players in baseball is Yuan Moncada. But for, for some reason, he hasn't put it together. Right. And I know you've talked about like the talking to your, your father and his absence from his parents when he came over here from Cuba and Yuan Moncada doesn't have his parents here. He doesn't have any family here with him. That definitely plays into his, his uh, ability and, and whether or not he can put everything together, right? What is your your plan or your strategy toward to getting Yuan Moncada back to what White Sox fans in baseball knows what he can be? I've had uh, a handful of conversations with uh, Moncada this offseason. He wants to be great. He's had years where he's been great, um, and he will be great again. We have to – you know, understand how difficult it is to not be able to see your parents for a long period of time. Uh, I empathize with that. Um, I had to move to Arizona for 12 and a half years to become the field coordinator in Seattle. And uh, even though it was a great job, you know, I missed home. I missed my people. You know, I missed my father, my mother, my, my sister, my brother. You know, I, I just missed being a part of it. However, you know, this is what we chose to do, right? Um, and for us to be able to provide for others, um, we have to focus on this. Um, I empathize with what he's going through. Uh, I'm going to be there for him. Our coaches are going to be there for him. Um, we're going to help him in any way that he can, uh, any way that he needs help. We're going to be there for him. Uh, and I and I have uh, complete faith that uh, this year. Uh, he's going to come out and uh, be the Moncada that everybody everybody is looking for him to be. But the most important thing is understanding, you know, that what he's got, what he goes through. I mean, come on, his family's in Cuba. He's here, you know. He he's really close to his to his to his family. I mean, you know, that, that's that's tough. Sometimes we gotta, you know, walk in somebody else's shoes a little bit to realize, you know, what, you know, how difficult it is to perform at a high level with unbelievable expectations, you know, and at the same time, get home every night and have to make a phone call, you know, or try to FaceTime your, your family if you can, um, you know, just to communicate with them or see them, you know, and, and, and not being able to be next to them and give them a hug or a kiss for, you know, eight, eight, nine months at a time. That's difficult, man. Yeah. It's, it, I, I couldn't even imagine. My, my parents are 40 minutes away and sometimes that feels like it's far, you know, no doubt, no doubt about it. Oh, no. Um, ball go far, team go far. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, so former White Sox hitting coach who I talked to him a couple times, great guy, Frank Medicino, love him. He was talking about Andrew Vaughn a year and a half, two years ago, viral quote in, in White Sox Nation, fuck the home run, hit 300. White Sox fans don't like that. He said that he said that to Andrew Vaughn. Are you going to put a priority – on hitting the shit out of the baseball, if it's not dead this year, if it's a live ball, hit the home run. Yeah. Here's our philosophy on this. Okay. Um, 
I would love to, and our staff would love to, and the whole organization would love to sit back and watch these guys bang. Okay. Watch these guys hit three run homers, watch our pitchers come out, shut out, you know, throw, throw shutouts and one, two, one, two, three runs and beat, beat somebody's ass, you know, 10 to three. I would love to see that every night. However, the reality is that that's not going to happen. Right. My question is how do we win when we can't hit tonight? Tonight we're facing a guy, you know, he's on, we're not, we're not on. How do we win? You know? So yeah, I would love to sit back and watch these guys bang, but that's not, that's not going to happen, you know, 162 times a year. My question is how do we win when we're not swinging the bat, you know, and that's where we come in, right? That's where our philosophy comes in. Our culture comes in. That's where, you know, the mindset of playing every night to win a baseball game um, is it takes, takes on a challenge of, you know, it's a collective, it's a collective group trying to win a baseball game tonight. What does that mean? That means that we got to move a runner over, we move a runner over. All right. We realize that we're facing, you know, so-and-so tonight he's on and uh, our guy's on too. And it's a, you know, it's going to be a tough, tough, low scoring game. How are we going to score more runs than them? Uh, so if it's a bunt, it's a bunt. If it's a move a runner, move a runner, ball in the dirt, ball in the dirt. Whatever the case may be. So, yes, I would love to see our guys bang, and we will practice for that. We will prepare our guys to put the ball in the seats and to drive in runs and, you know, and OPS and all that stuff. We're aware of all that stuff. However, we have to prepare to win baseball games when we're facing the DeGroms of the world and the Scherzers and, you know, these these guys that are – that are the best in the world and they drive Mercedes too, man. Those guys drive Mercedes too. So, and there's a reason why they drive them, you know? So we have to be prepared to beat them when, when we're not swinging it. Two more quick baseball ones. And then just a, a couple, just Pedro Grifo, the guy questions. Yasmani Grandal healthy is one of the best catchers in baseball. So you're hoping for a very healthy Yasmani Grandal this year where you, you hope he can catch a night game and then catch a day game. The, the, the next day to where you, you don't have to move things around and put Eloy in right field. So you could have Yasmani at DH and, and that, and then is Andrew Benintendi your two hitter. Grasmani, uh, Jasmani Grandal is um, not only healthy, but he's hungry. Um, this guy's one of the best catchers in the game and has been before. And He's been hurt by some injuries. So he's not only healthy now. I saw him last week. He was down here in Miami. He's not only healthy now, but he's hungry. And that's a, and that's, and that's a good combination for the Chicago White Sox. Okay. Um, he's got something to prove. Um, he's got a little chip on his shoulder. Uh, and I like that. I like our team to have a chip on their shoulder. Okay. We have something to prove. You know, 81 and 81. Uh, it was not acceptable last year, and it's certainly not acceptable this year. I mean, um, you know, I know I can't talk about 162 games without us playing one, but um, we can't hide the, the fact that we're expected to, to do some special things. We can't, you know, the expectations are there, the pressure's there. We're not going to hide from it. It is what it is. However, we're going to play, we're going to play tonight. We lose short term memory. Let's play tomorrow night. Okay. Um, the second question is, is Ben Benintendi going to hit uh, two? Don't know that yet. Obviously, he he's, he's has the capabilities of being one of the best two hitters in the game. But I've also hit, I've seen him hit third and being and and him being at at certain periods of the season being one of the best third hitters in the game. Um, I've seen him lead off, uh, even though I really like you know Ta there. Uh, but those are all conversations that we'll have in spring training with our players. You know, when we talk about empowering and communication and that that's all going to happen in the spring. We're, we're going to talk about our lineups. We're going to not that it's not it's not entitlement. It's empowerment. You know, so we're going to communicate. We're throwing stuff. We're, we're putting everything on the on the table. We'll talk about it and somebody has to make a decision. And that's going to be me. Obviously, I'm the manager of this ball club. Uh, but uh, I'm not doing this thing alone. Uh, we got a hell of a staff. We got a, we got guys in that in that clubhouse that have done really good things uh, at the highest level. So 
we're gonna we're gonna communicate well in the spring and come up with a nice little plan for 162 games. The the one holdover outside of Ethan Katz and Kurt Hassler, who are both excellent at their jobs, is Daryl Boston. And White Sox fans, I think, were a little confused about that um, with everyone else gone. You like you like him at, at first base, like as a first base coach. And, and look, how- one of the one of the things that was uh, really attractive. Uh, about this job, um, it wasn't only that it was a great team in a great city, with a passionate fan base. That you know, coming in there as a visiting club, I absolutely love to hear the fans. Okay, they they know the they know the game. It's not like they're screaming BS at you. You know what I mean? And just they know the game. They know and and you know what? They'll they'll cheer for the other team if it makes a good play. They'll 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 rag on you if you make a bad play and a bad fundamental play um but most of the time they know what they're talking about and you hear it you know you hear it out there so uh but one of the most attractive uh things about this job is is the ability to to assemble a staff that you feel comfortable with so when we were assembling this staff um i interviewed Debo. i interviewed him you know what? And I liked him. I liked his energy. I liked uh, his looseness. I liked what he brought to the, you know, to the table. Um, you know, I, I just I like the experience he's got. I like what he's, I like what he's done. Uh, players love like, him too. Players, players love him. Love love they, they love him. They respect him. Um, you know, we're all as a staff. Um, hold on a second. We're, 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 um, you know, I feel we have a really good staff. Um, you know, this, this game, uh, is a really tough game. Um, and I'm comfortable with, with what our staff brings to the table every day. So if it's not, if it's not baseball for you, I just, I'll get you out on, on a couple of these. If it's not baseball, what are you doing? Like if you're not watching baseball or thinking about baseball, what's the, what's the hobby or, or what do you, what are you spending your time with? You know what? I get asked this question a lot and people think I'm boring as hell. And, uh, it's not that I'm boring, but it, this game beats you down for eight months. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it takes you away from your family a ton, right? When the off season rolls around, I just like to be around with my, uh, be, be with my family. Okay. No, you know? see, no, I'm not going to take. I, I'm just telling. I'm just no. telling. You, I, I just like to be around my family. What I, I know you do, but but let's say your family doesn't exist. Let's say you never met your family, and this is before baseball, and you had another option. What would the other option be? Oh shit, man! I, I go to I I find myself at the University of Miami watching basketball games. Oh. I go to uh, I go I went go watch uh, now you know watch the Heat, the Dolphins. Watch the I went to Chicago, watch the Bulls. Yeah, go see the Blackhawks. Play pickleball. Um, you know, I mean, I I don't like golf. I fish a little bit, not okay. too much. I love to. I love to go out in the ocean. I love boating. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I mean, there's not much to me, man. I don't, you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what, I, are you, what, what are you expecting me to do? Go surfing? Well, I mean, what? what, what no, are like I, I don't know. Like, hey, I wanted to be a. When I was in fourth grade, I wanted to be a. That's one of my favorite uh, questions to ask on a date or something like that, right? Like, hey, when you were in fourth grade, what did you want to be when you when you grew up? Like, it, maybe it, I want to be a fireman, or I want you know to. What I want, you know what I was doing in fourth grade? I was I was playing hooky from school. My dad would pick me up at one o'clock and take me over to Bobby Maduro Stadium and watch the the Orioles play the Yankees, so I can see Cal Ripken, Earl Weaver, and all these guys roll, roll around. I mean, that's okay. that's me. That's what I that's what I do. That's respectable, and it, it, it and it shows me that you're the right guy for this job. But we got to work on that. <laughs> We'll get you. We'll we'll have a, a couple larcenies at the the chef's table at Rosemary. We'll get Joe in there, and we'll we'll work on some other things that you can have interest in. Chicago is a big city. You're gonna want to get a boat. You're gonna want to go out on the playpen. It, I, don't know. I have done. I, well, I have done that. I've been on I've been on boats in Chicago. I love boating. Okay. You know, I love going out there and just again yeah. just sitting there. You know, just just sitting out there in the ocean in the lake, just just doing that. You know, and and just relaxing. Like, but, like music, um, you love Fleetwood Mac. We know that you're a big Fleetwood Mac guy. But I love, like, I love Chicago, all great music city. Of, all kinds of music. Fleetwood okay. Mac. Uh, we um, uh, let me see here. Uh, we the Kingdom, Holy Water. I watch. I hear it all the time. Sure. Pink Floyd. I love Pink Floyd. 
Okay. Um, Mark Anthony, uh, Bob Bob Seeger, uh, Zach Brown Band. What, I love you, all. You're a Zach Brown Band fan. I love. Oh, Pedro, I, I'm gonna free give you- free the the song. I love the song free. That's my favorite song. Zach Brown uh, Band is headlining uh, our country outdoor barbecue festival at the United Center parking lot this summer. Uh, Windy City Smokeout. So when? I will make sure to get you VIP. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in now. When is that? Do you know? That is, it's the, I think it's the first weekend of August. I, I'll look at the dates and look at your, your schedule and, and make sure we can get you there. But it's oh, Zach Brown Band. It's four nights and it's, and it's 45 barbecue vendors. And then Zach Brown Band, Luke Bryan, Zach Bryan, and Ooh. Darius Rucker. Four nights I, in a row. I saw Luke Bryan when he was, um, when he was opening for um, uh, Tim McGraw, oh wow, in, uh, in in Arizona, probably fifteen years ago, man. And I saw him, and we, my wife and I, were there, and we're like, "This guy's pretty damn good, man." Yeah. You know, next thing you know, this guy's a just a stud. Um, so I would love to go. I would love to, you know, to okay. be a part. I just saw Zach Brown Band here last year. They came to uh, they came to Miami, and I went and saw them with my wife and my sister and, right. and my niece. Love it. This isn't, I like Kansas City, but this isn't Kansas City. Like you're about to head, I fully envision you here for the next 15 years of your life. You're going to retire White Sox manager. You're going to have the best 15 years of your life here in Chicago. We're going to get you some more. I love the way you're thinking. Yeah. That's a, that's a that's a ton of old fashions. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a lot of old fashions. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm I'm technically supposed to be unbiased or whatever because I work in the media, but all that's bullshit. Um, I'm a giant White Sox fan, so I, I hope nothing but the best for you and your tenure here. There you go. Thank you very much. You Cheers. Thanks for doing it. I appreciate it. Thank you.